My name is Paul Gooding. Um, I have the really catchy job title of Digital Human. No, I can't remember it. <laughs> Eastern Art Digital Humanities Research Fellow. And as you can tell, it's really catchy and I can't even remember it. Um, in a former professional life, I was actually a librarian working in broadcast media, and later on I was a project officer for the Digital Preservation Coalition. And this is kind of where my interest in what I'm going to be talking about today comes from, in preserving video games. I'm actually also a lifelong gamer. Oh, the GIF's working, that's quite scary. Um, I learned to type on this game, ABC Liftoff, um, on my father's ZX Spectrum in the 1980s. And when I found this picture, this GIF online, I was kind of like, why didn't I have nightmares? I was playing this game as a four-year-old, and microchimp is just terrifying. Um, my interest in video game preservation actually started a lot later than that, in around 2007. I was completing my qualification in librarianship, and I became interested in why video games weren't being preserved. So I wrote an article entitled Grand Theft Archive, which I'm still really proud of the name, I've never topped it, and it attempted to give a snapshot of the state of computer game preservation. And it became evident while I was doing this research that very little action had been taken to preserve the history of video games at this point. The situation has improved somewhat since then, but the intention of my talk is, my today is to think about how video game preservation is affected by digital storefronts and by the trend to remaster old games. I'm also going to turn briefly to some of the wider issues around this um, to think about why gaming has largely been ignored by, ignored by heritage institutions despite its undoubted significance as a contemporary cultural medium. I'm going to start though by talking about medieval monks, um, which might sound a bit weird, but I was talking to my colleague um, who's an expert in medieval literature about this talk and I was explaining what I wanted to talk to her about and she was like, that sounds a lot like St Francis of Assisi. And she was telling me the story of this guy. He's one of the most venerated religious figures in history. He was born in 1181 or 1182. He died in 1226. And he was canonized as a saint in 1228 by Pope Gregory IX. And he was responsible for founding the Third Order of St. Francis. He was the first recorded person to receive the stigmata in 1224. But this isn't actually what interested me about him. That's him in the middle giving his mantle to the poor man on the right. Um, well, that wasn't what interested me. What was interesting to me was when my colleague told me about the way his biography was written. And um, the most famous biography of St. Francis of Assisi was written by this fellow in the middle here, doing communion for, for a man in the bed. And this is St. Bonaventure. He's the most famous biographer of St. Francis of Assisi. And by the mid-13th century, he was the Minister General of the Franciscan Order. He agreed to write an official life or biography of St. Francis of Assisi, snappily titled Legenda Maior. Not so unusual, um, but when it gets interesting is that once he finished his official biography, the general chapter, which was basically the Franciscan Order's annual general meeting, ordered that many other accounts should be destroyed. So they went, actually went round to the other monasteries and said, we would like you to destroy your accounts because now we have the definitive account of St. Francis's life. All the former legends, uh, so the, uh, Rosalind B. Brooke, who is a, a scholar of the period, writes that by 1266, Bonaventure is persuasive and in control. All the former legends are to be destroyed, and where they can be found outside the order, the brothers are to take care to withdraw them, since that legend which has been compiled just as he had it from the mouths of those who were with St. Francis virtually all the time. Bonaventure seemingly wanted this to be his definitive account. Um, and why have I chosen this as a, a thing to start? Partly because it interested me when I, my colleague mentioned it, partly because it reminded me of this, which you may all be familiar with. So in August 2014, Konami released PT, which is short for Playable Teaser. It was a free download on the PlayStation 4 network, and the game out acted as a teaser for the in-development Silent Hills, which was directed by Hideo Kojima in collaboration with Guillermo del Toro. <coughs> PT uses a first-person perspective. Your character wakes in a haunted suburban house and explores an L-shaped corridor with adjacent rooms to explore. And the player is limited in their actions to walking and zooming and must use these limited inputs to investigate supernatural phenomena, solving puzzles to complete the section, at which point they reawaken at the start of the corridor, tasked with investigating the same space over and over again with a small number of changes until they, they solve the puzzle and they complete the game and they see a trailer for, for Silent Hills. Um, it received excellent reviews. Eurogamer's Jeffrey Matulev commented that PT's biggest surprise isn't that Hideo Kojima is making a Silent Hill game, it's that it's one of the medium's most unique horror experiences in its own right. But, in the style of BuzzFeed, you won't believe what happened next, except you will because I'm sure most of you know. 
Um, after announcing that the new Silent Hill game had been cancelled, Konami removed PT from online stores around the world, effectively doing the same as Bonaventura and the Franciscan Order did, using their digital delivery platform to remove it from history. This, of course, went down like a lead balloon. Writing for Polygon, Nick Robinson described Konami's decision to delete the game from the PSN store as the most irresponsible, cowardly decision possible. A game about supernatural phenomena has sort of become a ghost in its own way. This idea of the Phantom is something that I'll return to later. But in the meantime, one thing that is important is that PT isn't entirely gone. Robinson writes that despite Konami's best efforts, quote, PT isn't actually going anywhere. The game was downloaded over one million times, which means it's backed up across over one million hard drives and solid state drives and over one million PlayStation 4s around the world. In reality, the game is not going to truly disappear, at least not until those hard drives start failing. And this is where it becomes interesting, because unlike paper, unlike the accounts that survived Bonaventure and the Franciscan Order's attempts to delete them, paper is, is famously, famously easy to preserve, can keep it for centuries and centuries, but the digital medium is anything but. Once those consoles inevitably break, PT probably will become lost to the world unless Konami decide to release it from their own commercial archives for the public. And it's sort of due to an ironic mix of publishers' will and a lack of will of our regulators and heritage sector to preserve video games. Um, and one of, the, one of the prominent scholars working in game preservation at the minute is James Newman. He wrote a book in 2012 called Best Before, where he presented a case study of the original arcade version of Donkey Kong, which came out in 1981. Um, it's been constantly revised, remastered and re-released on different platforms through the years, as this unfortunately slightly pixelated picture shows. Um, and as he writes, whether born of artistic intention, technical limitation or the ability to utilise the capacities of later generations and hardware, each of these different versions is similar enough to be Donkey Kong, yet different enough not to be. And you can see here the development from 1981, this arcade game with a, a sort of very pixelated character, to the, the Diddy Kong suddenly appearing alongside him and to this really cartoony modern day Donkey Kong that we all know and recognise. Um, and this sort of leads him to ask the question, what is the authentic Donkey Kong experience on this screen right now? Is there even such a thing as authenticity when we think about games and the way that they change over time? Um, and as I said, I'm a librarian, so I'm just going to go to library and archival science very briefly to talk about authenticity where it has a particular meaning. And the National Archives in the Netherlands define it as authenticity is a central concept in the preservation of records. It means that a record conforms with the original. So what they mean by that is when a library or archive takes an object into their collections, they produce a record. It says what the object is, who produced it and when, when the object was received, and what it looked like or what it contained on the day it was received. Any changes need to be accounted for and wherever possible avoided, otherwise we risk breaking that link so that someone in 100, 200, 300 years time can go to that library or archive and they can know that what they're looking at, what, they, what item they're using is exactly the same as the day that it was accessioned to the library or archive. And the remastered video game is just one example of the changes that such an object can be subjected to. So the term remastering, which I'm sure you're all quite familiar with, has most commonly been used in the music world, where a master, which is a completed final piece of work, is changed in some way. The changes can include noise and artifact reduction, equalization, audio compression, and loudness maximization. The popularity of the master for music comes from the potential for increasing audio dynamic and frequency ranges, um, through use of digital media, and of course, as video games have as well, the um, possibilities for remarketing older materials and older intellectual properties. Remixing, on the other hand, is slightly different. Whereas remastering can be likened to cleaning and repairing the original, remixing involves changing the constituent elements to create something distinctive from the original. And I think actually modern video games kind of do both. So they're quite dynamic media. They're not stable objects. So not only do they live on through their continued relevance and influence, but they're also literally constantly renewed and reimagined as objects in flux, as objects that are changing through time, through remasters and patches, which I think are two things that are quite distinctive to the, the online era of, of, vid of video game storefronts. Uh, oh, I put a thing on this. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of this subtle difference between remixing and remastering, and how it affects... How it affects... 
I'm going to have some pictures of Monkey Island in just a second. Um, how it affects our experience. So the original Monkey Island was released in 1990. This is actually the original game as it was released. Um, and it was released on the Atari ST, MS-DOS, and Sega CD. It's a classic point-and-click adventure, and the, pirate the player takes on the role of Guybrush Threepwood, a wannabe pirate who does battle with the pirate the Chuck to rescue his love, Elaine Marley. So it began as a material object. The photo shows the original unboxed Amiga version, including fl four floppy disks, various advertising inserts, and two virtually extinct objects, one of which is a printed instruction manual, which you can see just under the box in the middle there with the skull on, sort of in black and white, and next to it, on what will be the right, your, your left, sorry, I'm trying to, trying to work out directions, um, is a code wheel. So what the code wheel was, for those who haven't used one, is, is a wheel that requires you to match on-screen faces to, to the wheel to reveal a password to access the game. It's really kind of basic, early digital rights management. Um, and all this was on an Amiga home computer with a mouse, a keyboard, and a CRT monitor placed on a desk. And then this is what it looked like originally. So you can see that when, when you then take it to the modern day, it suddenly becomes a very different game. So instead of having the box and the, the manual, you suddenly have this thing on the PlayStation Store where all you have is a, is a storefront, is a web page, which has information. Um, digital files take the place of manuals, and the game itself has been updated. Um, so this is the PlayStation 3 version. Um, your only experience of the materiality of the game is via the devices which you use to play, control, and display the game. You download a physical file, a digital file for the online documentation, and your PSN login replaces the need for a, a code wheel. So these screenshots show a major leap in graphical performance. Um, so you can see here from the, the shift from the what was called the SCUM interface. I can't remember what it stands for, but it's still a great acronym. SCUM. Yeah. Stands for script creation utility for Maniac Mansion. Script creation utility for Maniac Mansion. Yes, I think that's what it stands for. That's good knowledge. <laughs> so script creation utility for Maniac Mansion. So this is what the original Secret of Monkey Island was made in. This is an entirely different version. They also changed the control scheme. So instead of using a text, the text-driven system where you clicked on words, um, Special Edition allowed players to use console, console controllers instead and represents a conscious renegotiation of gameplay systems. So it means that modern audiences can interact with a game in a way that's more familiar to them than perhaps people in the 1990s would have been doing in a different way. My next example, which I think, rather than this, which I would, I would say is sort of a remaster, and a bit of remixing. My next example, inspired by Dean's great talk earlier on, I'm also a huge fan of the Souls games. I think Dark Souls 2 is another great example of something of the, the, where the game is not only remastered, but remixed. It was a last-gen multi-platform role-playing game released in March 2014, and it was set in the fallen kingdom of Dran Lake. The game tasks the player with taking control of a hollowed human, a zombie-like being who must battle extreme odds to obtain four great souls. And these souls are, of course, still attached to humongous bosses, like the slightly disturbing one that Dean showed us. And the game is defined by From Software's slogan, You Will Die. And just over a year later, an updated version of the game was released, entitled Dark Souls 2, Scholar of the First Sin. And it included an upgraded game for next-gen consoles with better graphics, um, provided players with a complete range of DLC levels which had been released. And these levels were a huge amount of content which was absent from the original disc version of the game. So as well as noticeable improvements in graphical fidelity and performance, um, the game designers moved the location of enemies subtly in the game world, much like they did with the Resident Evil remake, where they, they, there was this, the shock scene in Resident Evil where the dogs jump through the glass. And they changed that in one of the remasters so that it happened at a different point in the game. And in doing so, they changed the player's experience of the game in some subtle and some unsubtle ways. Dark Souls 2 also, as this screenshot shows, this is um, a mix of co-op and player versus player combat going on in Dark Souls 2. Um, and it has an extensive online, um, online aspect. And other players can be invited into your game world to fight cooperatively, or to engage in player versus player combat with other players. As with so, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> as with so many online games, players quickly learn to take advantage of glitches and balancing problems to gain an advantage in the heat of battle. And From Software responded by repeatedly patching the game to address performance and balancing issues. The second patch stopped players casting buffs on particular weapons, while the third patch nerfed a spell called Soul Geezer. It halved its damage stat, 
increased its casting speed and increased the stamina cost of casting it to stop players abusing those things in player versus player combat. And in order to play online, players had to update their game to the latest patch, thus overwriting, overwriting the previous versions that they had on their consoles. So the version of record actually kind of changed with each version. So both of these games simultaneously remaster and remix well-loved games. Both were remastered after the introduction of digital delivery, and the constantly connected nature of modern gaming devices has significantly influenced how we experience them. So whereas before the game released on disc, the Monkey Island disc that we saw not long ago, was relatively stable, could be quite more easily archived if the value of archiving those games had been realised at that time. The modern remastered versions are digital files which allow publishers to push updates to gameplay, graphics and performance on a regular basis. The online aspects of video games change the way we experience them in so many ways. So if you ignore the patching, for instance, without connecting to the Dark Souls 2 live servers, we're left without the ability to experience these extensive online aspects of the game. Even if we were, in 25 years, if we go to an archive or a library and play this game, we're not going to have a live server to play on. So the game that you will play in the archive in the future will be, in some aspects, extremely different to the one that you play now. Um, and they constitute significant changes to games and render each version as distinct from the last, which means a constant style, a cycle of remastering and remixing, which, uh, remixing, sorry, which occurs alongside the more significant work in a remastering sort of the version 2.0. Um, and then we have Chucky Egg here, who's, uh, as, as you probably guessed, I'm a big fan of the ZX Spectrum games and the 1980s games. Um, and the archival literature kind of differentiates between two things here. So there are two things going on. There's the preservation of digital data, which is the preservation of the files themselves, the underlying code that makes up the game. And there's also preservation of program behavior, which is the instantiation, the, the, what that code actually looks like when it's running on a screen and is being played by someone. And our experience of authenticity can be significantly affected by even subtle differences in how the game is preserved. Two of the major technologies for preservation are emulation, which is recreating the original game in a software version of the original hardware. So for instance, with Microsoft's Xbox One, that's the way they've created backwards compatibility, is they're emulating games in their, in their new console. The other option is migration, which is reprogramming the game to work on a new system. So this the, the quite an interesting study in 2006 by Hedstrom, Lee, and the others, was looking at Chucky Egg. So what they did is they got, them, they got the original version from the BBC Micro, it was a popular 1980s BBC Micro game, um, and they asked volunteers to play the original alongside an emulated version and a migrated version. And the interesting thing that they found was that a lot of people playing the game kind of had, a, had this sort of reaction where they're like, it's really sad that we're not playing the original game. Um, they, they said a few subjects lamented the loss of the original game feeling, but most valued the greater ease of manipulation and faster speed of the migrated and emulated versions. So while the authenticity, while the original game was negatively affected by playing a remaster, uh, uh, an emulated or a migrated version of the game, users actually still preferred the updated version because they closely matched their, their contemporary sensibilities. And in this respect, remasters actually fulfill an important role in an industry which is so reliant on novelty, which is that they keep video game history alive and modernise graphical and gameplay elements to match the expectations of a modern audience. It doesn't quite work all the way over here, it's a bit weird. Um, but through the remaster, game creators can simultaneously assert the authenticity of a particular version of a game at a particular time, while providing remasters and incremental upgrades updates which undermine authenticity at the archival level that I've been talking about a little. So the difficulty of offering an authentic video game is that in the digital age, defining the authentic experience is problematic. So as this photo shows, authenticity of the experience of playing a game can even be down to the marks that you leave on the screen when you're playing a, a touchscreen game. So you can see here on that side of the, the slide, the different shapes, I hope it's clear from where you are, the different shapes of, of playing a different game. So Fruit Ninja is kind of just this mess of doing that, oh, excuse me. Um, whereas Field Runners has this, this distinct action where you're doing the same thing over and over again. And Angry Birds, you can see, is centered on one side of the screen and you're keeping on doing the same thing over and over again from that side of the screen. So actually, in order to preserve an authentic experience, you could argue that we should preserve iPads which have this specific game on with these specific marks on screen. Um, but 
there comes a point where, where archives can't achieve this. Adrian Maldonado, for instance, said that preserving the physicality of game players is vital as preserving the game itself. And he used the example of how players used to blow on their Nintendo Entertainment System cartridges to make them work. But how far do we go? We can risk sort of fixating on providing an almost impossibly specific snapshot of a place and time. And James Newman, in his book Best Before, makes this case. He argues that we cannot adequately preserve video games as the experience that I've been talking about, so that we should aim to preserve evidence of this experience. Gaming websites, merchandise, consoles, video games of history, screenshots, boxes, all these sort of things which tell us something about the game without actually being the game. I agree to some extent, but I think also that preserving the game is vital, but that we need to develop an understanding that archive, the archival object is not precise, it, oh, excuse me, is not a precise reconstruction of how gamers played a particular game in a particular place and time. And I don't think this is actually an alien concept for librarians. Actually, we don't expect to go, for instance, returning to the, the medieval manuscripts, we don't expect to go into an archive and sit and read a manuscript by candlelight while surrounded by people dressed in, in monastic robes. We expect there to be a difference when we actually experience it. We don't expect the precise experience to be preserved by the archive. Um, and um, there was a quote, I won't go into Derrida too much because I'll just bore everyone, but a quote that he used in his seminal archive fever work where he said that what is no longer archived in the same way is no longer lived in the same way. And perhaps with video games we have to accept that that's an inherent risk of when we actually archive these games. And this is where digital preservation comes in. Um, so in libraries and archives, it's a formal process which is designed to ensure that digital information of continuing value remains accessible and usable for future generations. But first, we sort of need to, I think, finish on an almost negative note and think about why games are not rigorously collected for the public in the first place. So formal responsibility for preserving textual media falls under the, uh, a piece of legislation called the Legal Deposit Act. So it's a long-standing law which has been on the statute books in the UK since 1662 in some form or another. And it states that copies of every single text publication in the UK must be deposited with the British Library so they can be preserved for future generations. But films, music and lately video games fall outside this formal strategy for collecting games. So who does preserve them? Game developers and publishers have been criticised in the past for being lax at preserving their own games, either because they didn't consider preservation to be important and therefore had no long-term strategies for preserving them, or because it was in their commercial interest to remaster games for new audiences rather than look to the past. But there are two problems with this, which is first, the responsibility for preserving media as objects of cultural importance is rarely seen as a job for commercial companies. National libraries, for instance, exist to take that responsibility on their behalf and preserve these objects. Um, and where companies do have archives, they generally require them for their own reasons, because their old games and their old intellectual properties are worth money to them, and because they need to go back to the original code in order to use them in future commercial, commercial endeavours. But they're not public archives any more than you'd expect to go into a law firm and use their library. Secondly, there are signs that they actually are increasingly taking this extremely seriously. So there's a recent Game of Sutra article where they interviewed Ken Lobb from Microsoft Game Studios, and he revealed that the company stores multiple copies of each game published by Microsoft in humidity, temperature-controlled environments, multiple copies, both on-site and off-site, which is like state-of-the-art archival processes, but they're for their own internal use. So the question is, why do video games continue to be ignored as archival objects? by institutions that have a public-facing aspect to them, like the British Library. Um, why can we go to the British Library and read the Final Fantasy VII guide in print, but not actually play the game? And the technical and intellectual challenges that I've sort of had, had an overview of today are some of those reasons. But the, there is a feeling, and I, I, I have the feeling, that if people really wanted to preserve games, they would find ways of getting over those technical and intellectual barriers. They would actually solve them because they do so with other media which are challenging to preserve. Um, and we can think back to other media to understand the problems that this leads to. The film industry was similarly late in preserving its history. Writing in 1993, the prominent film historian and preservationist Robert A. Harris quoted here, said that over 50% of the films made before 1950 were entirely lost to history. The early movie studios considered reusing their materials and clearing their vaults to be more important than the films they produced. 
film reel was expensive back then. It was seen as a bigger asset than the things on the film reels. So the films themselves were considered worth preserving when weighed up against the cost of doing so. And I think there's a link to video games here that in, in society they're not considered to be worth preserving, despite their cultural value. Uh, but as I said at the start, maybe a, a little point of, of tinging the negativity with a bit of positivity. Things are changing. So when I looked at this topic in 2007, very little had been done in the UK to preserve video games, which is really important because they're such a regionalised thing. The, the PAL region of Europe, for instance, the games can be very different from the North America, from Japan. Um, and since then, the National Media Museum has launched the National Video Game Archive, which I'd recommend anyone who's interested, uh, interested checks out. They're doing really good work. But they're not formally supported in the same way that the BL are. There's no regulations to help them to collect video games, and their efforts attract little public funding. Um, and as I said, there's no regulatory support for preserving video games. So given that we only have voluntary arrangements for the century-old film industry, the BFI only does, is not entitled to copies of films that are published in the UK, for instance. I wouldn't hold your breath about this changing. So that's sort of my slightly negative ending, is that in addition to considering the ways in which gaming culture and technologies have caused a shift in how we understand the materiality of games, there's a more urgent and ongoing need to consider how we can preserve them for the public um, in a sustainable and rigorous manner that means we'll be able to access them for years to come. So PT, I think, is a really good example. If, if the BFI or if the National Video Game Archive had been able to, con to, to archive that under some sort of regulatory thing, then there would be less of a concern about what Konami did with their actions of removing it from the store because there would be a copy of public record available in a public institution. So the how archiving games and thinking through aspects of authenticity for when we actually give people the experience in a library or an archive is interesting but it almost still comes after this thing of convincing people that games are worth preserving. Um, thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions, then please, please fire away. Yeah. I've got a million, but I'll limit myself to two. That's, they're related yeah. to, um, to, to PT and to Kojima, and I guess to the issue, what if people want to actively erase uh, or when you have institutions that are actually interested in erasing elements of the past and <laughs> yeah. working against archives. Um, so my, my first question, less serious, is do you think perhaps that Sony's recent announcement of the PlayStation 4.5 is almost perhaps a way of Sony ensuring that hardware with PT gets erased or displaced by a new hardware base? It's <laughs> <That's laughs> a very it's cynical way of looking at it. They seem to always allow it, because they're, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but also in the other, closely, I guess, how digital humanity more widely, I was just reading a thing about how Kanye West has recently taken to editing his own albums post release. Yeah. So that I should so music is taking from games the element of the idea of downloadable content or patching and stuff. I guess is is it, is there a potential where like the kind of the iterability, iterable nature of game like media is gonna become a problem for other for archiving other media as well, where we might have multiple instances <laughs> yeah. of an object. Yeah, uh, so the the questions there was is is PlayStation 4.5, a strategy to delete PT. And the second question was whether this, this sort of patching thing is, is bleeding into other, other media environments and causing problems. I'm not gonna comment on the first one, but I like the idea. I like, we've got a million copies of PT out in the world, so we'll change the console. I quite like the, the cynicism behind it. Um, but I think you're right. I think that actually the problem of, of online delivery especially is, is something that's a severe problem for other media. I mean, Amazon's the perfect example. There have been the many, well, not many, there have been a few famous examples where Amazon or a publisher or an author has decided they no longer want their books in, on, on a Kindle. And Amazon can now remotely delete your kin books from your Kindle. So as soon as you connect your Kindle to the web, Amazon can delete stuff from it automatically. And you sign up in the terms and conditions when you use your Kindle for them to be able to do that. So the only way that those books that Amazon have decided to delete from your Kindle can remain on your Kindle is if you never connect it to the web again and never download another book. And it's a huge problem because it's, I'm speaking as a librarian here, so rather than a creator, and I think there may well be creative reasons why people want to delete certain works from, from memory and to change them and maybe improve them or whatever those reasons are. As a librarian, I think that what would have happened in the past with those things is that there would have been like one copy sat in the British Library somewhere 
that a historian could have come to in a hundred years and gone, okay, well, Kanye decided he didn't like this version of the track, but there's a music CD in, in, this, in this archive, so I can go and look at the original, I can compare it, and I can do some interesting work. And that's what we're losing, is the ability to go back to the original in easily, and potentially the, the, the ability of the company to delete the original as a matter of public record. So that, for me, as, as someone from a library background, is where my concern is, and I think certainly it's leaking all, into all sorts of other media. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I liked your bit about um, sort of the online experience and the um, like pushing patches to make sure that people sort of don't abuse bugs and stuff. Yeah. I was sort of curious about your opinion on like the always online experience. So like recently there was an issue where EA decided to shut down the service for a game called Dark Spore, mm -hmm. and Dark Spore is. Um, designed in a way in which the player needs to log in to be able to access the game and play the game. Yep. And now that they've shut down the servers, people have copies of these games which they aren't able to play and access because the company is no longer, longer supporting it. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I think it's a real problem. Sorry, uh, so the question is about, um, sorry, so just for the, the, the recording, the question is about games that servers are switched off for which need to be always online what what what's my opinion on what happens yeah. to them i think it's a real problem because again it's it's sort of getting into slightly boring things which is the way that modern media is licensed has changed so actually when you buy that game when you buy dark spore from ea you're not actually buying a, a game you are buying a license to access that game mm -hmm. so actually there's this really problematic thing where EA are perfectly within their rights to do that because of the way that consumption and, and purchasing of media has changed, and they're within their rights to do that. What they don't do, which I think would be a much more reasonable approach, is, is necessarily allow people to set up their own servers. And then that, that authentication problem is a huge one. It's also something that affects libraries, I think, because um, as I understand the law, libraries are allowed to archive things, but they're not allowed to break digital rights management. So in that example, for instance, if, if the BL was to take a copy of that game, they wouldn't necessarily be able to break the authentication yeah. legally. So you're kind of putting a barrier in front of the users and a barrier in front of the, 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 the archives that might, might design it. And I think it's a huge problem. Um, and I think it comes back again to this, there's this sort of a wider cultural issue of, of the way that companies have used digital to assert rights that are beyond their legal rights. Yeah. And that's a big problem. It's something you see in the legal deposit law that came out. I think the electronic legal deposit started in 2012. And the rights that they've given publishers under electronic legal deposit are actually more extensive than the rights that copyright gives them. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of asserting these new rights that don't actually exist in law at times. I mean, in that specific case, legally, they're probably entitled to do it. but. These things, these things are worrying. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Cool. In that case, thank you all very much for listening. And I think it's lunchtime now. And then we're back at one o'clock with Tom Phillips, who's going to be talking about the, the industry of video games and its cultural importance. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, for those of you who can make it back at 1 p.m., I think Tom's talk should be really interesting. So thank you very much for listening.